Happy New Year and welcome to another episode of Research Matters Podcasts. I am your host, Aishwarya Vishwamitra, and today I will be walking you through the editorial picks of 2019. The black and white stripes of a zebra may be attractive to us, but did you know that they evolve to confuse predators? It's called motion dazzle. The lines make it hard for the predator to judge the speed and direction of the moving prey. Some lizards have striking coloration in the tail, and it is meant to deflect predators to attack the tail instead of the body, so that the lizard can have a chance to escape. Lizards are ectothermic animals. This means they cannot regulate their body temperature, and their mobility depends on their body temperature. Researchers from the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Thiruvananthapuram, and the University of Turku, Finland, found that striped species of lizards had a higher body temperature than those without stripes. Remember, the motion dazzle only works when the lizard is in motion. Thus, lizards with the longitudinal stripes and higher body temperature have higher mobility and can rapidly escape from predators. Some lizards have both body stripes and colorful tails. The researchers suggest that body stripes and colorful tails likely evolved in lizards that are active during the day, maybe because the colorations would be ineffective in the dark. Rightly so, the researchers found that colorations in the tail are correlated with the ability to lose the tail. I mean, otherwise what would be the use of deflecting the predator to its tail? The study was one of the first to use data from real animals to understand this phenomenon and its evolutionary significance and it applies to almost all lizard species worldwide. One of the growing concerns today is the rise of antibiotic-resistant bacteria that have evolved to haunt us as superbugs. Hence, it is becoming increasingly difficult to treat infectious diseases like pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, and other foodborne illnesses. Many types of bacteria found in the soil produce antibiotic compounds that kill certain disease-causing bacteria. On the other hand, some of these disease-causing bacteria have evolved to withstand the effects of these antibiotics. Sound similar? Researchers from the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Kolkata, and McMaster University, Canada, looked into a competitive model of three types of bacteria. 1. Antibiotic producers. 2. Non-producers that do not produce antibiotics. And 3. Other sensitive bacterial cells that succumb to antibiotics. This is very similar to how rock, paper, scissors works. Sensitive cells outcompete the non-producers due to their higher growth rate. Non-producers outcompete the antibiotic producers and hitchhike on the antibiotic producers' ability to reduce the growth rate of sensitive cells. Antibiotic producers outcompete sensitive cells by reducing their growth rate. Sensitive cells, non-producers, antibiotic producers. So how do they coexist without the antibiotic producer overtaking them all? The producer's growth rate is in fact suppressed by the metabolic cost involved in producing the antibiotic. This cost reduces their own growth rate on the one hand and inhibits the growth rate of sensitive cells on the other, leading to the coexistence of the three species. Understanding them will surely help understand superbugs. Mathematics at school was rote learning for a majority of us and the formula for the surface area of a sphere was one out of the several which we had to learn by heart. What about using methods from ancient mathematical studies? Researchers at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, compared the first methods that Greek and Indian mathematicians of the old era used to find the surface area of a sphere. In terms of India, Bhaskara provided the correct formula for the surface area of a sphere in his most famous work, Leelavati, in the 12th century CE. He suggested dividing the sphere into a series of strips. Each strip, when peeled and unrolled, forms a trapezium, whose area can be calculated using a known formula. Using an established relationship between the distance of the strip from the center and its dimensions, its area can be calculated. The sum of the areas of all strips gives us the surface area of the sphere. The second method is by cutting the sphere like an apple. 
The slices can be peeled to form crescent-like shapes of the same size. Bhaskara further cut the crescents along latitude lines to obtain triangles at the end and trapezia in the middle, and used known formulae to calculate the area. Summing the areas of the triangles and the trapezia gives the surface area of the sphere. Can you visualize this? Wouldn't it be easier to learn math this way? Although the mortality rate among children in the age group of 5 to 14 years is lower than those below 5 years of age, an estimated 1 million kids in this age group still die around the world. Researchers from Canada, Brazil, China, Mexico, India and Switzerland have tried to uncover the reasons behind this alarming statistic by analyzing the causes of deaths in these children from India, China, Brazil and Mexico. They found that most of these deaths arose from preventable or treatable conditions. Among the common causes of death were communicable and non-communicable diseases like transport injuries, drowning and cancer. The analysis for India has some disturbing results. India was the only country where communicable diseases still account for nearly half of deaths. The leading causes of death in India among girls were diarrhea, followed by malaria and then pneumonia. On the other hand, boys mostly died of drowning diarrhea and transport accidents. This clearly shows that the majority of these deaths among children in this age group are preventable. Vaccinations and antigens against communicable diseases and primary care treatments are the needs of the hour. The story was a particularly interesting read because of the use of data visualization like bar graphs and pie charts. Have you heard about black holes? those monstrous structures in a universe that swallow up everything within their reach, including light? Until now, how exactly a black hole looked has been a bit of a mystery, since no telescope had ever taken a picture of these gigantic structures, and their images were only limited by our creativity. As our editor said, science reporting, unlike others, provides fewer opportunities to report live and as it happens, because science writers typically pick a study or report then build a narrative around it and finally present it to the readers. However, for the first time, Research Matters tuned into a live press conference of the world's historic scientific breakthrough, the release of the first photographic evidence of the black hole. This photo was clicked by the Event Horizon Telescope, a virtual Earth-sized array of eight ground-based radio telescopes located at different parts of the planet, synced through atomic clocks. As you probably know, some plants invest energy in making fruits especially to draw birds and animals that can disperse its seeds far and wide. Researchers from the Nature Conservation Foundation Mysuru observed 43 plant species and 48 bird species in Pakke Tiger Reserve in Arunachal Pradesh and have identified the different networks formed between the trees and their avian seed dispersers called frugivores. They observe small birds like bulbuls and larger ones like hornbills, which eat a variety of fruits from different trees. They found that as the size of the bird varies, the size of the fruits they eat also differ. If the seed is larger than the bird's mouth, it merely pecks at the fruit and does not disperse the seeds. However, large birds have large mouths and can swallow the fruits and disperse the seeds without damaging them. Therefore, they dropped a smaller proportion of fruits than other smaller birds increasing the probability of successful seed dispersal. After, guess what, a mammoth 2065 hours of observing birds and the fruits they ate, the researchers found that networks were formed between the frugivores and plants. Large frugivores, like the hornbills, had trees with bigger fruits entirely dependent on them for dispersal. Medium-sized birds, like barbets and bulbuls, ate fruits from most plants and played a central role. Often, every species has its place and a distinct role to play, and this study showed the importance of all birds, big and small, in a forest. The University of East Anglia, UK, and the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Chennai, India, explored how women's work in agriculture affects nutritional outcomes for the family. The study found that although agricultural outputs have increased with women working in the farms, 
it has left them with little time to cater to the nutritional needs of their families and themselves, resulting in malnutrition. The researchers used data from 12 villages in two Indian districts, Odisha and in Maharashtra, about the socio-economic status, livelihoods, farming and agriculture practice, and diet of households in each district. Additionally, the researchers found that time spent on productive activities, like paid domestic services, market-based work, and work for self-consumption, and reproductive activities, like unpaid domestic work, care and voluntary work, and finally, non-productive activities. The study found that on average, women spend more time on productive and reproductive tasks than men, but their labor in most cases is still classified as unpaid family helpers. Plus, the burden of agricultural work is disproportionately distributed between castes and ethnicities. The strenuous work not only affects the health of the children, but also that of the women. For example, during planting and harvesting seasons, women are severely sleep deprived. These conditions, the researchers say, can lead to weight loss, diabetes, hypertension, heart diseases, and other health ailments. It comes as no surprise that India is battling severe air pollution. While this might seem a problem localized to Delhi, the rest of India doesn't fare well either. 14 of the top 15 polluted cities in the world are in India. But so far the primary focus of studies on air pollution in this country has been on Delhi. But a study undertaken by researchers from the Desert Research Institute, USA, and Urban Emissions investigated the emission levels of multiple pollutants in 20 other Indian cities, other than Delhi. The cities chosen included Bengaluru and Chennai, two mega cities with a population of over 10 million. The researchers found that vehicle exhaust, suspended dust, construction activities, industrial exhaust, domestic cooking and heating are the primary sources of emissions in all cities, and that all of the 20 cities exceed the annual particulate matter 10, standard of 60 micrograms per meter cubed. The researchers also calculated the possible emissions by 2030 if the rate of emissions continued to be as today. The study also pushes for regional air quality management strategy and a sustainable transport policy. This article was supplemented by data visualizations too, making it all the more interesting. Where did we Indians come from? In a pair of studies published by a consortium of international researchers, including those from India, the origins of present-day Central and South Asian people have been deciphered. They have used recent advancement in genetics to extract and analyze genetic material from the remains of several ancient populations, including people from the Indus Valley Civilization. If we look at the present-day South Asians, a majority of their ancestors are the people of the Indus Valley Civilization. The steppe pastoralists were nomads from the steppes, a temperate zone stretching from modern-day Bulgaria in the west through Manchuria in the east. They combined information from the Y chromosome inheritance data and non-sex chromosomes to see that the steppe ancestry was introduced into South Asia predominantly by males. They found that the ancestral South Indian pop population was formed by a mixture of the Indus Valley and the ancient ancestral South Indian population. On the other hand, the ancestral North Indian population were formed by a mixture of Indus Valley people with the steppe pastoralists from the Eurasian steppes. The study is the first of its kind to use ancient DNA samples to paint the history of today's Indians. Do you remember the Bhopal gas tragedy? It claimed thousands of lives and injured a few lakhs of people. The culprit was a toxic gas used to produce a pesticide called carbaryl. Unfortunately, the use of carbaryl continued amid growing concerns about its side effects. Therefore, the need to completely remove it from the environment or break it down into less harmful substances is of primary importance. Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, in collaboration with the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi, achieved a significant breakthrough in identifying bacteria which can clean up this pesticide from the environment and have understood how the breakdown occurs. The researchers found three strains of the bacteria Pseudomonas, which efficiently remove carbaryl. Many microbes can degrade carbaryl, but the pseudomonas strains reported in this study were more efficient. However, the first breakdown product, 1-naphthol, produced within the body of the bacteria 
is even more toxic than carbaryl itself. How does this tiny bacterium survive this toxicity? A bacteria has two membranes, inner and outer, with a compartment called the periplasm in between. Degradation of the pesticide carbaryl into one naphthol takes place in the periplasm. The inner membrane thus protects the main body or the cytoplasm from naphthol and it allows it to slowly enter the cytoplasm and convert it into a non-toxic compound. Additionally, pseudomonas are known to promote plant growth. Scientists from the Indian Institute of Science Bengaluru have tried a way to kill two birds with one stone by treating malaria and tuberculosis with chloroquine, a well-known anti-malarial drug. Unlike malaria, treating tuberculosis is not simple and the patient needs to take antibiotics for over 6 to 9 months to prevent a relapse. Because of the length, many patients discontinue their medication and therefore, there is an alarming rise of drug-resistant tuberculosis. When infections strike our body, cells in our immune system called macrophages detect the invading pathogens and kill them by releasing oxidants. However, drug-resistant tuberculosis are smart. They release antioxidants and get away from being killed by the cells. The researchers at IASC took a closer look at this mechanism and found that drug-tolerant bacteria chose to occupy the most acidic macrophages and use the low pH as a signal to produce antioxidants and thus cause infection. That's when the researchers realized that chloroquine, an anti-malarial drug, could possibly help. It reduces acidification and immune cells. When they tested it along with commonly used anti-TB drugs, they found a five-time increase in bacterial death. The researchers now plan on testing these drug combinations with chloroquine on humans, giving hopes of curtailing drug-resistant tuberculosis infections. When welfare schemes are announced, it is prudent to check on the process of such schemes and to verify if it is reaching the intended beneficiaries. In 2016, the Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana was introduced. This is how it works. For the first LPG connection, the government pays half the cost, which covers the security deposit, pressure regulator, suraksha hose and demonstration charges. The beneficiary pays the other half to buy a cooking stove and an LPG cylinder and can be loaned from oil marketing companies. In the Koppal district in Karnataka, researchers from Canada, Austria and the USA work together to compare the number of PMUI beneficiaries, LPG purchases and LPG consumption rates. The study found that enrollment did not translate to actual LPG use. General LPG consumers had almost two times more LPG refills than Ujwala beneficiaries. Even among the general users, the total LPG consumption was low enough to suggest that LPG was being used as a secondary fuel in rural areas. So what's stopping people from using LPG as the primary fuel source? By tracking LPG sales for five years among rural consumers, they found that LPG consumption was strongly determined by LPG price, subsidy amount, and climatic conditions. For example, during the dry part of the year, when wooden material to build a fire is easily available, LPG use plummeted. The researchers suggest that seasonal vouchers or other incentives must be provided to all consumers to increase LPG sales within the rural community. Do you know what microplastics are? Microplastics are small, barely visible pieces of plastic, about a few millimeters in size, formed from plastic debris that break down into small pieces over time. They have now invaded the entire planet, from land to mighty oceans to rivers and lakes. Researchers at the Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam, Kerala, have reported that microplastics have been found in the sediments of the Vembanad Lake, Kerala. The study found that the northern parts of the lake, influenced by the sea, had a higher abundance of microplastics than the southern side. This is probably because 4% to 6% of the municipal waste generated in Kochi is plastic was due to the lack of an efficient solid waste disposal system gets washed into the surrounding water bodies, then into the Arabian Sea, and in through the northern part of the lake. Once the microplastics get into water bodies, they do not just remain there, they spread into the aquatic ecosystem, affecting the food web. Fish and other aquatic life forms end up feeding on them, and eventually they enter the food chain at all levels. The only route that remains for us to escape from the mess of microplastics 
is by the controlled use of plastic, reduction in plastic waste generation at the source and to reuse and recycle what we already have. Two of these articles have been about superbugs and drug-resistant bacteria in humans. This one is about farm animals. Researchers from several institutes including ETH Zurich and the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in New Delhi have mapped the global trends of antimicrobial resistance in farm animals with particular focus on developing countries including India. Their global comparison shows that the most significant hotspots of antimicrobial resistance in animals are in Asia, which is home to 56% of the world's pig and 54% of chicken populations. In Asia, Northeast and South India stood out along with North Pakistan and Northeast China. The ever-increasing antimicrobial resistance levels in animals are anticipated to have huge effects on both animal and human health. The World Health Organization has set up the Global Antimicrobial Surveillance System or GLASS to report AMR in humans. Ever wondered why the prick of a needle is painful but you never notice a mosquito pierce your skin? While the mosquito saws through the skin with the back and forth motion of its proboscis, needles often pierce it forward with all the force. Scientists have now taken clues from such insect stings to develop needles of various shapes and sizes, including those that can reduce pain and a study by the Indian Institute of Technology Kanpur found that low frequency vibrations along the axis of the needle considerably reduces the resistance to piercing, thus reducing the pain. The researchers measured the force experienced by a syringe needle as it moved inside a block of polyacrylamide gel mounted on an acrylic sheet. When they vibrated the gel at a frequency of 20 Hz in the direction of puncturing, the resistive force experienced by the needle before the gel cracked was much smaller. They found that increasing the amplitude of the vibrations reduced the resistance and the total energy required to puncture the gel decreased as well. Less painful needles are on the way. Thank you for listening to this episode of Research Matters Podcasts. See you next weekend. For more such science podcasts and news, please log on to www.researchmatters.in.